It's just a more stable S10. And uniformly cyclic acetals, pretty much any acetal, but any heteroid. And the mechanism is going to be identical with the protonation addition, proton transfer addition, proton transfer product kind of thing. So you can take a dye dial and you'll stick the lava. But if you take a dye dial in acidic conditions, you will form your thio acetal. Via a pretty much an identical mechanism to this, just replace oxygen with salt. Or you could even. By the way, alcoholic, I made that term up. It's an acetal. But I felt like I needed to, if I'm calling the hydrate the hydrate, I felt like I needed to give that a name and ended eight as well. So that's not a technical term, just so the camera knows. Let my PhD advisor sees this somehow. I'm going to let him know. Or you've even taken amino alcohol. And you'll get something that looks like this. So it's still, this is actually called, again, this is a hemi aminal, and it's an aminal because it's an amine and an alcohol. So it's still like acetal, you just replace the T with an N. Uh, for whatever reason. And for nitrogen as a demonic device. But still, you can, you can form things like this always. And like always, you can change your conditions from having excess of your thiol or your amino, amino alcohol to just favoring H2O and water and drying it to get the carbonyl back. So depending on whether you're favoring your nucleophile or, or your solvent as your solvent or having water as your solvent, you can control whether or not we get the cyclic uh, thioacetal or aminol, and then you can each take these back under acidic conditions to get our carbonyl. So uh, is this useful? And it is useful because you have to realize this chemistry, this class has been fun to carbonyls, right? I mean, no, carbonyls are very electrophilic and we can add, and we can add things into them very easily. So just an example of why, you know, these acetals are useful, other than the fact that they form in biology, and I'll show you an example with sugars in a second. I'll be, I'll, all of you guys who went to the review session will find my example very boring because they went over it in great detail. But acetals are great ways to mask carbonates. <clears throat> All right. Is this a stable grignard? No, it's not. What? Because it's got a carbonyl. <laughs> So it will just add into the into the carbonyl, and that's great if you want to make the one, two, three, four, you know, four member uh, uh, four member cyclo alcohol, cyclic alcohol. But if we if we wanted to add this to something, we wouldn't be able to do it because it would add the carbonyl first. But what we can do instead. is make our cyclic acetal then add our Grignard
and this is going to be more stable than this is. So this won't be able to do the intramolecular attack because it's not a carbon hill, it's an acid hill. So as far as this is concerned, this is just some fairly stable five-membered ring. Then you can take your electrophile. So someone give me an electrophile to bring our lab into. Anyone, give me an electrophile to bring our lab into. Formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is a good one. But yeah, carbonyl is great. So you can take our formaldehyde. Bring it out, we're adding to this. Pastel will still be in play. One. And so here's the alcohol we get from this adding in. And we now just have H3O in water. Then dry. And you just did our Grignard chemistry without having to worry about our uh, pesky carbonyl getting going. So acetals, a lot of people like to call acetals carbonyl masking groups. So it's a way to mask a carbonyl so you can do chemistry that you normally can't do in the presence of carbonyls. Yes? How would you add the bromine to the terminal? What's up? Oh, because that's just, what do you mean? Why, why if, you? if I didn't want to add a bromine to it, then that bromine, uh, how would I add a bromine to it? Uh, what I would probably do, to be honest, was I'd start from the alkene, then do some kind of, you know, do some kind of hydration or hydroboration, and then do PBR3. So, yeah, you know, chemistry we've talked about before. What's up? You wouldn't be able to do it if you didn't have an alkene. Well, so your question was, how would we just take this, right? Right. And it would, well, uh, you would probably just start, you take the alcohol and make the bromide from the alcohol. And then that leads to the question of how do you make the alcohol? And then, you know, there's a million ways we talk to make alcohols. So it could be a question in the exam, how to make this, right? So maybe that's part of 232. Yes? So after you have the Grignard attack, the formaldehyde? Yeah. Where is that picture of H? Uh, which H? On the very end there, that chain. This here? Yeah. Oh, which? I have to get up real early in the morning to uh, get something past you guys. Yeah. I just, I just didn't draw my water quench. So in general, to do a Grignard chemistry, you can assume you quench it. Stop it. <coughs> All right. So, carbon meals, carbon meals. So now let's go. Well, first up, before I talk about uh, more aminals and imines, let me draw the sugar exam. Let's do a biochemist. Why, why do biochemists care about acetals? Biochemists care about acetals because sugars are connected. Well, sugars are acetals that are connected to other sugar monomers be an acetyl bun. So let me draw table sugar for you. And so remember how to draw your chairs. <coughs> the practice exam last year, I asked everyone to draw the chairs, this most stable conformers of glucose. And I, I you know I love asking 232 type questions just to keep you guys awake and not let you guys purge that fireball chemistry you wanted in 232. So drawing chairs is always a good thing. <coughs> But remember when you draw chairs, it's always parallel lines, parallel lines, parallel lines. So I started off by drawing two parallel lines. Then I drew two more parallel lines at a slight angle. And then I connected the dots to get my chair or my Budweiser uh, kind of background. And then once you draw your chair, you just go to each carbon making sure that your carbon is tetrahedral. There should be alcohol, there should be a hydrogen. 
So you just go from carbon to carbon and make sure each thing is tetrahedral. And since I'm drawing glucose here, the cool thing about glucose is glucose is a sugar. Every one of its stable carbon oxygen bonds is equatorial. So glucose is the all equatorial sugar. So then you just draw nice tetrahedrons. Yes, nice tetrahedral carbons all around. Once again, glucose in its lowest energy conformation, all of the bonds are equatorial except for the acetyl carbon. And the, the acetyl carbon is going to be both equatorial and axial because it's an acetyl. So just so I can show you something cool, I'm going to draw table sugar. In table sugar, so this is table sugar, sucrose. How many acetals are there? There's two acetals. One here and one here. And so complex carbohydrates are sugar monomers that are all connected via an acetal bond. So where is the amide bond is the building block of proteins. Acetals are the building block of sugars. What's the building blocks of DNA? Phosphoesters. So, uh, here's sugar, uh, two acetals. So now you guys know why we care about acetals biologically. Now, if you excuse me, I'm gonna keep this, but I'm gonna erase the other part because I wanna actually show chemistry. So, for your mind, take a picture. This is table sugar structure. Now let's just talk about axial. So, under acidic conditions, there's an equilibrium between alpha and beta glucose. I believe alpha glucose is equatorial. But don't quote me on it, I'm an organic chemist and a biochemist, so I always confuse this nomenclature up. But one of the uh, glucoses, the carbon at the acetal, so the oxygen at the acetal is equatorial, uh, sorry, axial, and under acidic conditions, uh, we can actually uh, scramble the center to the equatorial version. But once again, just go around and you know, know how to draw chairs and draw nice carbohydrates at each of the chair carbons, tetrahedral carbons. It's always easier to draw the axial positions first because they're up and down, and then you can draw the uh, equatorial so you get a nice tetrahedron later. So under acidic conditions, we have an equilibrium between equatorial, sorry, equatorial and axial glucose, where equatorial for one, I believe it's beta glucose, is equatorial here, and then axial for alpha glucose at the acetyl carbon. So this stereocenter is labile, it's not stable. The reason it's not stable is because it's an acetal. And what can we do to acetal under acidic conditions? Things leave. So under acidic conditions, we can protonate the alcohol. For brevity, I'm not going to draw all the alcohols. I'm just going to draw a generic a bunch of alcohols off of this. So I'm just being lazy, but all the alcohols are still here. I just want to show that we are forming a OH plus. And now what could happen is 
is we can kick off the water, so this is just an acetal mechanism. Okay, and so now water can definitely add into this again. Then it adds in from the bottom face. That will give us this, which can then go back to here. If it adds in from the top face, it will switch to stereo center. So it will give us our equatorial attack. and then go back to here. So the reason why we have an equilibrium between axial and equatorial and sugars is because under acidic conditions we can just do acetal chemistry. We can kick off the water and then the water will add back, but since we kicked it off, going from this sp3 carbon to this sp2 carbon, we're actually losing our stereochemistry. So we're scrambling that center and then there's a 50 50 percentage chance you can add from the top or bottom face. That's the police this flow at that point, so some of it will go to here, some of it will go back to here. So that's a test question from last semester that a lot of people had trouble with. But it's, it's really just acetal chemistry, so all sugar chemistry is really just acetal chemistry. Yes? Because it's changed, and so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so being able to control axial versus equatorial at this center in sugar chemistry is still very largely an unmet problem. If anyone wants to be a chemist and have some real exciting proposals for research, see if you can figure out how to control that. I'm not smart enough to, maybe you are. Yes, yes. The other name, the, the uh, I guess the biochemistry term, although I'm nice, that's a bit, I'm impressed someone knew that term very good. So this acetyl carbon, the technical term for it is a glycosidic. Glycosidic. So, now what? Well, let's talk about amines. Now, adding it. And we talked about a cyclic aminol adding. Well, let's just talk about an amine. acid catalyst with the means you want to use catalytic. As I'm drawing the product up, is someone want to tell me why you want to use catalytic acid, not stoichiometric? What's the pKa of the mean? Is the mean basic? Yes. yes. If you use stoichiometric acid, are we going to have the amine or are we going to have the ammonium? Bring out the ammonium. Is an ammonium to be nucleophilic? No, it won't. So that's why with amines, you only want to use catalytic acid. So if you use catalytic acid, most of the acid is going to protonate the amine, giving us an ammonium. Ammonium is still kind of a Lewis acid, Bronstadt acid. And uh, the final thing I'll say before I, I confuse you guys even more is productive pathway. So yes, the amine's going to be protonated. I realize the amine's going to be protonated. I know, so we won't have any H3O in presence. We'll just have protonated amine and water. But through some way, shape, or form, we can still, the ammonium can still protonate the carbonyl. And then now our amine will add into the protonated Carbonyl. Wow. 
Like so. Now we can do a proton transfer. Well, this alcohol takes one of the protons from the ammonium. Is this going to be a favorable proton transfer? Or is it going to be a disfavorable proton transfer as far as the equilibrium is concerned? It's going to be disfavorable, right? Because we're taking an ammonium, which has a pKa of 10, doing the proton transfer, transfer to give us an oxonium, which is going to have a pKa of 0. So this is a pKa anchor. And last year, I, I challenged uh, any of my uh, students to make a, a parody song about PKA crimes, but no one took it up. Uh, no one took me up. I guess they didn't want to be sued by uh, Marvin Gaye. <laughs> I keep up with pop culture. <laughs> Just so I beat people in trivia crap, I'll be honest. All right, so this is a PKA crime. All right, so the equilibrium should favor this. Right, this equilibrium is going to favor a more stable thing. This is a more stable ammonium than this. However, if we form H2O plus, we can kick off water. And this will give us a double bond, carbon to nitrogen. So, it gives us this, which is more stable. So it gives up water, so it increases entropy, so that's nice. But also it's the lone pair of electrons on this nitrogen, they're in the mean, so they're still fairly high in energy. So by kicking this off and forming an SP3 amine to an SP2 amine, gives us a stabilization event. Because the lone pair of electrons are stabilized now that SP2 versus SP3, because as, the more S character you have, the more electronegative you are, so that's a stabilization event. So unlike oxygen, which will give you the tetrahedral acetal, amines will give you the double bond, the sp2 double bond. And then, of course, the water that was formed. You can grab the proton to give us our amine. So doing acetal chemi chemistry with nitrogens, you don't get the tetrahedral thing. You get your carbonyl, but it's, it's not a carbon oxygen carbonyl. It's a carbon nitrogen carbonate. So, yeah. Is the reason that goes even though it's unfavorable because there's not really any other well, well, so, ways? Or? It, it, so, this happens. So, even though this is unfavorable, yeah. the fact that this can kick this off to go to here, this is removing this from this equilibrium because it's going here. And so then Le Chatelier takes over. By the way, Le Chatelier is my biggest cop out answer. Le Chatelier